Round of applause, please. Okay, um, so I'm Dr Natalie Butcher. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology at Teesside University. And like Jenny, I'm interested in visual perception. Um, but the aspect of visual perception that I'm particularly interested in is face processing. So how we perceive the faces that we come into contact with on a daily basis. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what's in a face. So we all obviously know what a face is. We all have a face. We see faces every single day of our lives. We have to remember the faces of people that we work with or our friends and our family. But we don't really spend very much time thinking about actually how important the face is to our sort of social functioning, but also what the face can tell us. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to ask you to think a little bit more about faces than you ever have done before. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've learned for the last 10 years whilst I've been studying face recognition. So the first thing I want to think about is actually what can a face tell us? What information can we get from a face? First thing it can tell us maybe the gender of the person, whether they're male, whether they're female. It might also tell us about the age of the person. We might not get it spot on, but we can probably get a good estimate of how old the person is from looking at their face. The face can also tell us maybe how the person's feeling at any particular time. So if you look at somebody's facial expressions, it might tell us whether they're feeling positive, negative, or more specifically, whether they're feeling happy, sad, scared, surprised, all those sorts of emotions can be gathered from information about the face. The face can also maybe tell us a little bit about what the person's typically interested in at that moment in time as well. Because if you can look at where the eyes of the person are focused, then it might tell us what they're attending to and what information they're focusing on. So, for example, if you're having a conversation with a person and you can see that their eyes are all over the place, every, looking everywhere else other than you, then it might suggest they're not really very much interested in what you're talking about. Um, so, we can use it as sort of social cues. The final thing that the face can tell us is actually who the person is that's in front of us. So, we, when we're fa faced with a person's face, who is that person's face and um, who does it belong to? So from an evolutionary perspective, faces are really important because on a very basic level, they can tell us kind of who the friendly and happy faces are that we might want to approach. And they can also tell us who the angry faces are that we might want to flee from or if we feel so inclined, we might want to fight. Um, on a social cultural perspective, they can tell us information about um, important aspects of the way someone's feeling and their particular um, mood at that moment in time to help us with social functioning. So if we can see that somebody's feeling a particular mood, whether they're happy or sad, then we can adapt our own behaviours in response to that so that we can, if they're feeling sad, then we might not sort of raise issues that might make them more sad. So all that information can help us with our social functioning on an everyday basis. For me, the aspect of a face that is really interesting is actually how we remember a face. So the face as a cue to identity, and that's really important for social functioning as well. So just for a second, I want you to try to imagine everything that you've done for the last 48 hours and how many times you've had to recognise somebody's face in order to achieve what you were trying to do. So if you just think about what you've done for the last 48 hours, do you think it would be harder to do what you've done for the last 48 hours if you couldn't recognise people's faces? Yeah, a few nods. Yep. So um, it seems like a really absurd question for me to ask you to imagine life without faces because in general people are pretty good at recognising faces and it feels kind of effortless. But there's actually some people that have a condition called prosopagnosia. Um, prosopagnosia is also known as face blindness and it can be got through brain injury, so maybe strokes or any sort of car accidents for example. If the area of the brain is damaged that is important for face recognition then their ability to recognise faces becomes impaired. But we also know more recently that people have developmental prosopagnosia. So this is the idea that much like somebody with developmental dyslexia doesn't develop the ability to read in a typical way, there are some people that don't develop the ability to recognise faces in a typical way. And the current estimates, although there's not a huge amount of research on this, are that about 2% of the population actually have developmental prosopagnosia. So for these people, they can't actually recognise the faces of the people that are around them. Um, children find it really difficult in their daily lives at school because they use cues into like people's clothing to help them identify each other. And if you're in a school and everyone's wearing exactly the same <coughs> uniform, then that cue to their identity becomes very, very difficult. So it seems a strange question for me to ask you what it would be like to live without faces, but there are some people that live without being able to see faces, and some very profoundly, whereby they can't recognise even family members, um, have, they've walked past their wives, their husbands in the street and not realised it. Um, so, we maybe take our ability to recognise faces for granted a little bit. 
Um, it seems really effortless, we don't really think about it when we're trying to recognise people's faces. And I want to really make the case today that potentially face recognition is amongst one of our greatest achievements as humans in terms of our everyday functioning. And in order to make that case, I'm going to try to show you just some of the complexities of the face recognition process. So familiar faces are faces that we come into contact with a lot. So our friends, our family, the people that we work with, for example. And we know from lots of research that people are very good at recognising the faces of people that they're familiar with. So for example, friends and family of mine wouldn't have any problem whatsoever recognising that that little dude up there is me, not entirely what's your age. <coughs> This one is also me at the age of 18, and then you guys would probably also be able to recognise that this is me more recently last year at the age of 30. So for familiar faces, regardless of changes in lighting, changes in expression, changes in the angle that you see the face from, changes in age and weight potentially, then you are pretty good at being able to recognise that person's face if you're familiar with them. Um, there was a study by Barrick in 1975 that found that there was very little forgetting of people's names and faces in terms of who you went to school with over a 35 year period. So we're really pretty good with familiar faces. But what about the faces of people that we don't really know, we've not seen very much, or we've maybe just seen once or twice for a very brief moment in time? So these are unfamiliar faces. There's lots of research that's been, fo been found that really we're just not very good with unfamiliar faces at all. One type of task is a matching task, and this is very simply where you are presented with two different faces, and your task as the participant is to say, are these two faces of the same person, or does one belong to a different person? So quite a simple task, or it would seem a simple task for people to do. Um, these studies have been done in kind of ecologically valid environments, like the data I put up there was from a study by um, Kemp and Pike in 1997, and they did their study within a supermarket setting. The supermarket was closed, but they used the actual staff who worked in the supermarket, and they asked the cashiers to question the identity of anybody they thought was going through the till who had a credit card ID that wasn't a picture of themselves on it and they were motivated because they were told they'd get a bonus for um, how quickly and how accurately they did it. Um, so the researchers were interested in how many times the cashier questioned the identity of the person based on their card. The researchers sent people through the tills with cards with themselves on, and they also sent some people through with cards with pictures of somebody else on, and they were looking at the difference in terms of how many times they were questioned. Um, for the people that went through the till with a card with themselves on, they were actually questioned about 10% of the time, which suggests that the cashiers weren't very good at looking at the card and looking at the person stood in front of them and saying that actually these two, peop these two faces are of the same person, so about 10% of the time. And they also found that when somebody went through the till with a card that didn't have the p that person's face on, that 64% of the time they were allowed through if the person on the card looked a little bit like them. Um, more surprisingly and more scarily as well, potentially from a security perspective, 34% um, <coughs> of the um, people going through the till that had a card of somebody else who didn't look at all like them were also allowed through the till and weren't questioned at all. I hope this worries you a little bit. Um, there's also been a study done more recently in 2014 with passport control officers um, who you might think would be good at this task of saying, is this person stood in front of me the person that is on the card? Um, because they do that every single day. Um, White did this study in 2014 to try to really help improve security, not to show that they were terrible. But what they found was that 14% of fraudulent cards were able to get past the passport officers when the person was holding a passport that had a picture of somebody other than themselves. So there's some really serious um, security applications of this sort of research as well. But at a basic level, it tells us that we're just not very good at looking at two faces and being able to tell whether it is the same person or not. So unfamiliar faces with matching tasks, pretty bad. Um, what about learning faces then? So if we give somebody a task and say, I want you to try to learn these faces, we then show them another set of faces. Some of them will be the old ones, some of them will be the new ones. Are we any good at being able to identify which faces we have seen before and which ones we haven't seen before? So for example, just going to test you guys today. Um, I've shown you one of these five faces. My numbers have gone a little bit odd on the slide, I apologise, but if we just go along one to five, um, can anyone tell me which face you've already seen before, one to five? Five, three, five, three two, four, every single one of them you seem to think. <laughs> okay, I'll put you out of your misery. It's number four. Um, so number four was on the first slide that I showed. Um, I think we had every single number shouted out there apart from number one, so hopefully this demonstrates that we're not very good. Um, so 
this really shows us that we're just not very good. Even I, Obviously, I cheated a little bit because I didn't tell you you were going to have to recognise these people. But actually, if you were witness to a crime, you wouldn't have any idea that you were going to later have to identify somebody until after the point of the crime occurring. So in terms of like this testimony, this is kind of a realistic sort of situation. Um, we also, what we do in next studies is sometimes we'll show you exactly the same picture of the face that you saw when you learnt the face, like I've done here, but usually what we'll do as well is switch the face around. So you might see the same person, but we'll show it from a different angle or a different expression or just at a different time point, so they might be wearing different clothing, for example. If you give people exactly the same picture when they learn the faces as when we try to ask them to recognise it, people do pretty well, so they're up in sort of the 90%. But that doesn't really tell us about identity recognition, it just tells you about their ability to recognise that particular picture of the person. So when we switch it about, it tells us more about identity, and as soon as you switch the pictures around, so you have a different picture of the person at recognition, then performance just drops off very, very quickly. So all the factors that we know don't affect familiar face recognition, like um, <coughs> angles, expressions, lighting, ageing, all of those sorts of factors, they don't affect our ability to recognise a familiar face, but they do affect our ability to recognise unfamiliar faces like this. Um, one factor that I'm particularly interested in looking at that affects both familiar faces and unfamiliar faces is mo facial movement. So a face can move in two different ways. Ooh, where's my other bit gone? I think I'm missing a slide, it's fine. Uh, faces can move in two different ways. They can move in a rigid way. So this is when you're nodding or shaking your head, for example. So like this, this would be rigid movements. They can also move in the way that they have um, facial expressions and talking would be in non-rigid movements. So um, as I'm talking now, my face is moving and that's a non-rigid movement. Lots of research has found that the movement of a face can actually help us to identify the person. So we are faster and we're also more accurate when the face is moving, when we compare it to static images, so photos for example. Um, so we really are now trying to understand why that might be the case. Um, O'Toole and his colleagues in 2002 came up with several different theories of why movement might help us to recognise a face. The first one was the supplemental information hypothesis which is basically the idea that when you learn somebody's face, you don't just learn the structure of the face and the features of the face, but you also learn how that face typically moves. So if you think about when you see a friend walking down the street, you might recognise that it's your friend because you recognise the way that they move, for example. So it's the same idea, but specifically with the face. Um, so for that theory to be correct, you need to have familiarity with the face. Um, the other um, hypothesis, the representation enhancement hypothesis, doesn't require any sort of familiarity with the face. It just suggests that if you see a face moving, it might tell you more about the structure of the face. And then if you know more about the structure of the face from the motion, you can build a better representation in your memory of what that person looks like. And that then helps you to recognise them later on. The final hypothesis was the social signals hypothesis. Um, and this was the idea that the movement itself doesn't necessarily help you to recognise the person. But if you see a face move, it probably draws your attention to the eyes, the nose and the mouth. So if somebody's speaking, for example, you might be looking at those areas of the face and those areas of the face are really important for recognising somebody. So we've done eye tracking studies that look at what people are looking at when they're processing faces and those bits of the face, the internal bits are really important. So movement is kind of the advantage you get from seeing a face move is kind of a byproduct of looking at those features a little bit more. So the research that I've been doing has been trying to sort of look at these different theories and applying them both to familiar faces and unfamiliar faces to try to understand why movement helps us unrecognise people more. So I'm going to just talk about some of the studies that we've done and some of the key findings. Um, the first study that I've put up on the screen here um, is from a study which we did with, with unfamiliar faces. Um, so this was a learning task. The participants were given 10 faces and they had to learn each face. They were shown for two seconds only, so they see each face for a very, very short amount of time. After they've seen all 10 faces, we then give them a 30 second break and then we test their memory for the faces to see how many they can remember. So we give them the same 10 faces plus another 10 and they have to simply say yes or no, have you ever seen this face before? So quite a simple task again. What we did though was we manipulated how the face was shown to the participants both at the learning stage and also at the recognition testing stage. So some of the participants saw the faces moving when they learnt them, some of them saw static faces and the same again at the recognition stage. Sometimes they saw static and sometimes they saw moving faces. We did that to just really try to get to the bottom of when you're learning a face, is movement helpful when you're trying to learn it at the beginning or is it helpful when you try to recognise them later on? 
Um, the data up here, so the static static are the participants who saw static at learning and at test. The static moving is static at learning and moving at test. Moving static is moving at learning and static at test. And then moving moving is moving at learning and moving at test. Um, so as you can see, the increase in performance only comes when you have movement information at the learning stage. But so for the two columns at the beginning, the accuracy is fairly similar. So the movement of the second column for the group who saw movement at the recognition stage didn't really help them. But when the participants had movement information when they were trying to learn the faces, it seemed to boost their accuracy and they could recognise more of the faces. And they could also um, identify faces that they hadn't seen better as well. So it tells us for unfamiliar faces that movement information at the early encoding learning stage is really important, but it's not really quite so important at the recognition stage. And this is quite different to what we find for familiar faces, because when we do studies using familiar faces, like celebrities for example, then people benefit from having the movement information if we compare it to static photographs and even multiple static photographs as well. So there seems to be different rules for movement information dependent on whether the face is familiar or unfamiliar. So perhaps for familiar faces, they're benefiting from that sort of supplemental information about how somebody typically moves. But for unfamiliar faces, you just benefit from movement in the representation enhancement way that it helps you to build a more robust um, representation of the face. Um, but here again, we're seeing differences between familiar and unfamiliar faces. So just for this one factor that we know to affect face recognition, so movement, we're getting this difference between familiar and unfamiliar. And as I spoke about earlier, there's a big difference in terms of our ability to recognise familiar and unfamiliar faces. So I think for me, in terms of the field and the challenges that we have going forward, is for us to stop thinking about faces as being familiar or unfamiliar, and actually to think of them as kind of a continuum. Familiarity isn't dichotomous, it's much more of a continuum that we develop familiarity with somebody's face over time. So if we just study people that are completely unfamiliar or people that are very familiar, then it's not really going to tell us very much about how we develop that familiarity, which seems to be crucial for recognising a person's face. Um, hopefully what I've also demonstrated to you guys today is that face recognition is much more complex than we intuitively think it is. So next time you go to meet a friend or you go to meet a family member and you have to identify their face, hopefully you'll remember that actually that was a remarkable achievement, um, more so than it necessarily feels because it feels so effortless. <laughs> So I started today by thinking what's in a face and I'm going to end by saying that there's really quite a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs>